Hello, this is Cindy Gomez Shemp. Welcome to another podcast of the People's Press Project. As you all know, we've been having discussions about the new programs that were announced by President Obama recently on immigration. Following is a podcast interview with immigration attorney Anna Stenson, and we will be discussing the DAPA program. On November 20th of 2014, the president announced that within six months, USCIS would begin accepting requests for DAPA, the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents. If you receive deferred action under DAPA, you may be able to stay in the United States temporarily without fear of deportation. In addition, you will be considered for employment authorization, which would allow you to work legally in the United States for a three-year period. Who can request DAPA? Well, you may be considered for DAPA if you have lived in the United States continuously since January 1st of 2010 up to the present, were physically present in the U.S. on November 20, 2014, and at the time of making your request for consideration of DAPA with the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Service, USCIS, had no lawful status on November 20th, 2014, had on November 20th of 2014 a son or daughter of any age or marital status who is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident and have not been convicted of a felony, a significant misdemeanor, or three or more misdemeanors, do not otherwise pose a threat to national security and are not an enforcement priority for removal. Additional details about DAPA guidelines can be found at www.uscis.gov forward slash immigration action. How can you make a request for DAPA? While the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Service is not now accepting requests for DAPA at this time, USCIS is preparing to launch the DAPA program in mid to late May of this year. Please visit www.uscis.gov forward slash immigration action to learn more about the documents needed to support your request. If you need additional information, please contact us at the National Customer Service Center at 1-800-375-5283. That's 1-800-375-5283. Hello, once again, this is Cindy gomez Shemp with the People's Press Project, and today we are talking again about immigration information based on the recent announcement by President Obama on immigration. Today's podcast, we will be discussing DAPA, previously called the Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. It now has a new name. It is now the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans. And we will also be giving you an update on the expansion of DACA. Um, USCIS will now begin accepting applications for expanded DACA on February 18 of 2015. And furthermore, the USCIS has also created new flyers for those who believe that they qualify for either DACA or DAPA. So if you think you're eligible for the expanded DACA program or DAPA, now would be the time to start contacting an accredited representative or an attorney, immigration attorney, that can help you file your application. And today, we are lucky to have an immigration attorney with us. Thank you for being with us again, Anna Stenson. Thank you for having me back. Um, We want to talk first about DAPA. Um, Tell us first of all, when can people apply? How can I apply? And more about what the program entails. Okay, first, If you think you're eligible for DAPA, um, you're not going to be able to apply until probably around May 19th, 2015. So again, not something that you can do now, but it's something that you can start looking at and gathering and seeing if you're gonna be eligible. In terms of who's eligible, the DAPA for parents, um, you need to have continuously lived in the US since January 1st, 2010. 2010. 2010. Okay. 
and you need to have been physically present in the U.S. on November 20th, 2014. That's the date President Obama made the announcement about this new DAPA program. Okay. Um, and on that date, on November 20th, 2014, you have to show that you don't have any immigration status. Okay. So if you came to the U.S. legally mm -hmm. but lost your immigration status and you were, uh, didn't have status on that November 20th, 2014, you're gonna be you could be eligible. Okay. Um, the third thing is that on uh, November 11th, 2014, that you've had a son or daughter who is either a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident green card holder. Um, and then at some point, we're gonna have to prove, uh, prove that parent-child relationship. Okay, and does it matter uh, how old my child is, where, wh whether they're married or not, is that gonna be an issue? Right now, immigration is saying it doesn't matter if your son or daughter is married, single, or any other marital status. So right now, immigration is saying marital status of the child of of your son or daughter doesn't matter. In terms of the matter of the age of your son or daughter, doesn't matter. So if your child was born on November nineteenth, two thousand and fourteen, you're going to be eligible. So what is this uh, proving the, that you're the parent thing? How do you prove that you're? The, what does that mean exactly? Well, that's something that we don't know yet. Immigration uses different, defines terms like child differently than oh. son or daughter. So right now immigration is using the terms son or daughter rather than child. Okay. Okay. And, and so they've talked to, about, you know, proving the relationship between, you know, the parent and the, and the child. Um, first and foremost, I think you're going to have to show a birth certificate mm -hmm. showing that that is your child. Now, there might also be a requirement that you have to show some sort of relationship with the child. One of the things we don't know now is whether, adopt, uh, whether adopted children, stepchildren, or other types of, or illegitimate children are going to count. Those are... Oh, this is very complicated. Okay, well, we'll talk about this a little bit more with the children and the parent thing, but what... What things would definitely like be a barrier for folks to apply? Because I'm I'm sure that there's people out there that might be concerned about some of the background of their history or things that they might think disqualify them from these programs. Yep. One of the things that immigration is going to be looking at is on November 20th, um, President Obama also announced new immigration enforcement priorities in terms of people who are higher on the list for deportation. So if you have something that might make you deportable, you're going to have to figure out where you might be on that list. So somebody who is high in that deportation list won't get DAPA because, because they're high on that deportation list. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked before, uh, you know, any adult or juvenile convictions or contact with law enforcement. Um, again, immigration has started to define that you can't have a felony or a significant misdemeanor. But what, what's a significant misdemeanor? Like, give me an example of a significant misdemeanor. Um, one of the things that has been labeled a significant misdemeanor under the DACA program has been DUIs or driving under the influence. I see. Um, and that's one thing that we're expecting over the next several months that immigration is going to give us more information about in terms of what immigration views as a significant misdemeanor. Versus a, just, just a, a regular. For just a regular misdemeanor. And even if the state calls it just a misdemeanor, doesn't immigration might find it to be a significant misdemeanor. And also, if you have three or more regular misdemeanors, that could still be an issue. Yes. So this is where you got to call somebody like yourself and find yeah. out. What... Yeah, this is one of those where you definitely want to seek out an attorney or, or an accredited rep who understands it, what's the difference between a significant misdemeanor and a misdemeanor and a felony. Because again, it, if you've been convicted of a, of a crime that puts you high on that deportation list, it might not applying for DAPA at this time might actually get you into trouble. 
Yeah, or deported. Yeah, or and deported. Okay. Um, the other thing that immigration has been looking for is any sort of gang activity. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we're still not quite sure about is how immigration is going to treat somebody who has had fake documents or worked under somebody else's name or social security number. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be eligible, but it's going to be something that you want to be careful of in terms of what might make you not eligible versus what makes you eligible. Um, and kind of the other one is if you've ever been ordered deported, you may or may not be eligible. Some people who have been deported before are going to be eligible for, for DAPA. And that's another one of those. If you've been deported before or been turned away at the border, you're going to want to check to make sure that you qualify for the DAPA program. It's all based on specific circumstances of each individual's case. Yes. And so you really do have to have someone experienced in knowing what the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service people are looking for. Yes, both with the DAPA and the DACA, it's discretionary, meaning just because you can show the basic requirements doesn't mean that immigration is going to say yes. They're going to look at your case individually, both the good and the bad, to determine if you're going to get DAPA. Right, so it really is a good thing to get uh, qualified experience to check on those details because it's very complicated. Now, are there any other things that might affect your application that you should ask someone about? Yes, uh, anytime that you've been outside of the U.S., one of the rules, one of the requirements for DAPA is to show that you've been continuously in the U.S. since January 1st, 2010. So if you've left the U.S. at all between 2010 and to present, you should be concerned about how that's going to affect your DAPA application. Um, and then you're also going to have to show that you were physically present in the U.S. on that November 20th, 2014 date. And so that again goes to, you know, have, have you left? And if you did leave, how long were you gone? What did you leave for? Because all of those are going to be factors in looking at whether or not you're going to meet that residence requirement for DAPA. Mm -hmm. And um, we also talked um, about traveling and how sometimes that can... Uh, yeah get people deported or you know unable to come back into the country those all of those factors could also be important in the consideration of this program yes that that's true and especially if you think that you're eligible for DAPA you definitely don't want to leave the US until you until you you apply and receive that permission well what if I'm just going to be traveling in the US though uh, again, you know, you can travel in the U.S., but there's always a risk in doing that because if you have to board a plane, you have to show a photo ID, and if you and depending on the photo ID that you have, um, and it's not uncommon for uh, immigration to have whether it's the border patrol or other agents walking around and and asking people to verify their documentation. Um, at the same time. Immigration has announced that they're going to start informing their officers to look at when they encounter individuals to see if they could qualify for DAPA or DACA. And so it's going to be one of those, it could be fine, and you, you could encounter an officer who's, going, who's just asking to see if you do qualify, or you could be having asked a question where somebody is asking to see your documents who hasn't, um, isn't as well educated on the mm -hmm. DACA or DAPA eligibility. You know, for many folks, the stakes are so high that it's just kind of one of those things where you might be better off being safe than sorry. Yeah. Yes, that is definitely <laughs> one of those. I don't want to encourage people to put their lives on hold, but sometimes it, it's it's the safest just to stay put and until you if you can if you can. Um, and you know, emergencies come up, but you know, to make sure that if you are traveling, that you are aware that. Um, you can be asked for your paperwork and that, you know, could bring immigration to, to the attention of, of your status. So 
I want to get my application money ready uh, for me and the members of my family that might qualify for these programs. What do I need in terms of payment? Um, the fee that immigration is going to charge is going to be $465 per person. So if it's you and your husband, it's 465 times two. Right. If it's you and your husband and two children, then it's 465 times four. Mm -hmm. And um, and immigration, we're thinking, is going to be similar to the DACA program where they only allowed fee waivers in very, very rare exceptional circumstances. So, so there is, so there is a, a fee waiver option, but it's not going to be given out uh, easily. So yeah. people should expect that they're going to have to pay the fee. Yes, Un unless you have some sort of extreme hardship, um, most people are going to have to pay that fee. Now, if, if there is some huge circumstance as to why you can't pay that fee, you're under guardianship, um, or you're, you're very sick, you might be able to qualify for a fee waiver. That's again where you're gonna to wanna to go back and talk to an attorney or accredited representative to see if, if you do meet those guidelines for that fee waiver. But the idea is almost everybody is going to have to pay that $465 fee per application. And is there any other fees in addition to that that I need to think about or know about? Well, if you're gonna hire an attorney or an accredited representative, mm -hmm. then you're gonna to have to consider what the charges are going to be you know, for those. Um, here in North Dakota, I'm not aware of, of any nonprofit immigration agency that is accepting these cases, mm -hmm. um, whereas there might be other areas of the country where there are um, either group clinics or other immigrant nonprofits that can help people that might charge either do it for free or to do it you know, for a small amount. But that would be the other thing is that if, if you think that you have these problems that you might have to end up paying um, an accredited representative or an attorney to help you with this application. Um, well, what if I don't have that kind of cash? Should I, can I just go to that notario publico down the street and ask him because um, he's got some experience with this stuff I've heard and I don't think he's going to charge me as much. You definitely don't want to go to the notario. Uh, you want to only go to an attorney or a immigration authorized accredited representative because those are gonna be the people who actually know the program, who are going to be making sure you're getting the good advice and not just telling you what you want to hear or leading you to believe that you are eligible when you might not be. Is there some danger in that possibility like I mean can I just do the form over if he gets it wrong and then just go hire you um if you just do the form wrong because you forgot to fill in fill in a blank or or some minor technicality you might not get in trouble and you might be able to do it over again um, but if you were denied because you had a criminal issue or there was another problem that could actually get you into trouble and you're not only are you not going to be reapply, being able to reapply, you might end up in deportation proceedings. So that's pretty serious. Yep, that's pretty serious. Another one of those situations where you might be better off being safe than Yep, than this sorry. is one of those <laughs> where you're better off being safe than sorry. Um, even if you can't hire an attorney, you can maybe set up a consultation to go in and meet with an attorney and be able to talk with them about your particular background where they might be able to give you some advice and saying, no, you know what? I don't think you should apply because, um, right. or if they say, you know what, you might be, you might be able to apply, but you know, and you can either maybe do it on your own, or maybe you should think about hiring me, or you might be able to negotiate um, with that, uh, with the attorney or the accredited rep too. So, how can people get a hold of you? Let's give you give out your number and your contact information so that people can ask you questions here locally. Yep. My telephone number is 701-298-7720. Okay. And thank you again for giving us this information that we're receiving today and giving us help with understanding this quite complicated 
uh, new program that's available. Um, I do have some additional questions for you about this DAPA, okay? They changed the name, now it's Parents of Americans. That means my, ch what is my child? Can it be like my stepchild? Can it be, what, what is the definition? Some of those questions we don't know yet. Uh, we talked about a little bit about earlier, immigration is using the terms son or daughter, so they're not using child. Um, so right now there isn't an age requirement or age restriction for your child. Your child just needed to have been born before November 20th, 2014. Some of the things that we don't know yet is how they're going to treat stepchildren, illegitimate children, adopted children, um, and each immigration program defines those slightly different, um, but it is something that if you fall into one of those categories, you're definitely going to, again, want to get that, you know, have somebody look well, into that. Well, what if it's that. my legitimate child, but I've never seen them? I just found out that, that they existed. That's, and they're a U.S. citizen. That's something that, that right now that we know that immigration is looking at, that they're considering um, what they're going to, whether they're going to accept an illegitimate relationship or where somebody um, hasn't really had that parent-child relationship. I will, though. Once I become a citizen, I'm going to. Well, is, is that gonna? Is that gonna? I still need to find out. I would still, you know, find, <laughs> I would still find out because those are things right now. You know, immigration has said, you know, son or daughter, but right. they haven't really defined. It doesn't matter if I know them or not yet. We don't know. We don't. That's one of those that we're, we don't. We don't know yet because okay. the idea of the program was to provide protection for parents, right, of U.S. citizen children. Right. So. It, well, it is my it, my it, child. I just don't know him, <laughs> and and that, and that might be one where we're we're not quite sure yet because it might yeah. not be it might not be fair, right? And we're we're not we're not sure quite yet how immigration is going to define that. I think over the next several months, you know, some of the information about how, um, and you know, if it's a stepchild or adopted child, you're going to have to show different paperwork to show that relationship, and so those type of things are still. We're, I think we're going to learn more about over the coming months. Okay. Now, you said that you obviously can't be a felon, or some of these things are going to bar us from applying felonies or, you know, too many uh, misdemeanors or significant misdemeanors. Um, what kind of other requirements? Are, do I have to be a veteran, or do I have to, like, have a college degree? Do I need to speak English fluently? What Right now... You know, again, with the DACA program, mm -hmm. there is that educational requirement where you have to show a high school diploma or a GED. With the DAPA requirement, it's not about education. At one point, President Obama had been talking about whether there should be English requirements at some mm -hmm. point in time. You know, at this point, immigration um, isn't... Or taxes? Don't you have to pay your taxes, too? or so? Well... The, the expectation is if you get work authorization, you should be paying taxes going forward. Okay. At this point, it's not a requirement that you prove that you've paid taxes in the past. Okay. And so if somebody's telling you you need to, pay the, need to go back and pay taxes since 2010, that's not a requirement. Okay. It, it'll probably be a requirement that once you get that work authorization that you do pay taxes going forward, but then you're going to be working and you should be paying taxes. Right, right, right. Um, but and and two with that English requirement, there was some talk about that early on. Uh -huh. um, so far, immigration hasn't said that there's going to be an English requirement at at this point. Okay, okay. Um, so let's go over the DAPA. This is for the parents, right? The parents of American citizens or permanent U.S. residents. What are the benefits for me to apply? If you apply for and receive the DAPA eligibility, one, you're gonna get a work authorization card that's gonna be good for three years. So that's gonna give you permission to work for three years. Um, once you get that work authorization card, you're gonna be able to apply for a social security card. Um, and in many states, you're going to be able to apply for and receive a driver's license. Mm -hmm. um, the final, the big thing is once you receive that DAPA protection, 
Um, you're going to be protected from deportation as long as you stay out of trouble for that for a three year time period. Okay, now the DAPA, I apply for it and it will give me protection from deportation for three years. Do I automatically get the work permit or do I have to apply for that separate? That is, that's that 400 and, and the $465 is actually to get the work permit. permit. Right, okay, so I do get that. Do I also get my social security with that fee? No, you're gonna, once you get your work authorization card, then you can take that work authorization card to the social security office. So you're not just gonna authorize, I don't just get issued a driver's license and a social security card along with my work permit. Those no. are other steps I have to take. Yep, those are other steps and other benefits that you're gonna get once you get that work authorization card. But I would qualify, I would qualify for them if I became eligible for DAPA. Yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure that I clarified that. Yep. No, you're gonna be eligible for those, but you're not gonna get them at the same time you right. get that work authorization. There's a couple more steps in there. Yes. Okay, I understand now. Thank you once again. Uh, this has been very informative. Um, I hope to do uh, more podcasts with you so you can keep updating us on what's going on with this uh, immigration program, the, the immigration programs of DACA and DAPA, and um, we will keep the listeners up to date. We will also be announcing a town hall style meeting so people can check for updates on the People's Press Project and find us on social media and Facebook. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. This is Cindy gomez Shemp, and you've just listened to a podcast of the People's Press Project. We will be hosting a series of podcasts discussing topics related to the President's announcement on immigration, which will be broadcast in English and Spanish. Please share them and help us spread the word. To find out more information about this or other podcasts and online media, visit our websites at fmppp.org, mexi-can.org, or like and follow us on Facebook at The People's Press Project, mexi-can, and find us on Twitter at at media underscore ppp.